So hello and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. We honour the centuries of Indigenous people who have walked on Turtle Island before us. And we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work and play in Niagara and we give thanks to the ancestors who have served as stewards of this special place. So for this uh, session of Coffee with the Curator, I'm returning to an exhibition that was installed in, in two different versions from 2019 to 2020. Um, and it was very well received. We had many uh, very, very strong compliments and uh, interesting engagement with visitors. And in light of the recent developments, that is uh, our heightened awareness of indigenous settler relations, um, I think it was an appropriate time to revisit this exhibition and the themes that were explored in the exhibition, although it is not currently on display. But all of the works are from our permanent collection. Many Canadians were shocked to learn of the graves at former residential schools, a development that has added some urgency to acknowledgement of our history of colonialism and pressure to repair the relationship. So within this, con this conversation, I think it's important to consider the role of institutions, such as art galleries and museums. Both the representation and the naming of Indigenous peoples supported the process of colonization in the Americas. Depictions of First Peoples were an important and popular subject for European trained artists, and they convey the worldview of the colonizers. These representations are not innocent, but provide specific information about land, family structures, customs, social organizations from the perspective of a European observer. So here we're looking at a well-known uh, work from our collection by uh, uh, certainly a well-known and prolific and highly celebrated 19th century artist, Cornelius Kriegoff. And this is, uh, this is titled, Indian Council from 1855. So we're looking at a group of men sitting in a circle on the ground surrounded by trees. There are canoes in the foreground suggesting that in the participants have traveled perhaps some distance to attend the council. It seems quite tranquil. There's no hint of the contemporary, the local or the real. It suggests a certain timelessness associated with Indigenous peoples as existing outside of life in mid 19th century Canada. It has been described by the Canadian art historian Dennis Reed as based on popular understandings of native governance. And Reed uh, has done extensive uh, writing and, and research on um, in, on Cornelius Kriegoff. Uh, so it's, it's a, certainly um, an important observation, this idea that uh, Kriegoff is basing his painting on popular understandings, but there is an important um, absence in the painting that, that is not noted. And that is the participation of indigenous women in native governance. Uh, recently, there was an interesting exhibition in the States that paired um, paintings by European artists uh, documenting uh, treaty negotiations on the plains um, against uh, uh, documentation prepared by an indigenous artist. And although both are recording the same events purportedly, um, the European trained artist has removed all of the indigenous women who were recorded as present um, in the depiction by the Indigenous artist. So this, this kind of, um, let's say, editorializing uh, is an example of, of how a European trained artist is bringing his own perceptions about the roles of women 
in in society uh, to bear on a subject that um, is uh, you know, a subject that is purporting to be uh, in some ways documentary. So one of the principal differences in worldviews between Indigenous peoples and European settlers is ownership of land. To European eyes, uninhabited terrain was terra nullius, that is belonging to no one, the Latin translation. The empty vi vistas in a landscape painting are open for settlement and invite settlement and they're available as property. In contrast, indigenous peoples view land as communal in many, in many instances, something to be shared with an entire community. This fundamental difference in their relationship to the land has produced lingering conflicts over land claims. And other differences, as I've mentioned, in customs and gender roles and family structure and attitudes to art production even, are similarly fraught with the legacy of colonial colonization. Turning now to Indians of Lorette uh, by Richard, uh, John Richard Coke Smythe. And uh, Lorette is um, located just outside of Quebec City. Um, again, from the uh, Weir collection uh, the, in this, so in this lithograph, um, you'll notice how the figures are arranged. They've been given a, pyram um, a pyramidal structure. I always struggle to say that art historical term, pyramidal structure, uh, stable composition as it's interpreted um, uh, in terms of composition. And it places the male figure at the apex, suggesting a Western patriarchal organization, male as the head of the family, and it's grounded in Christianity. There is um, a, a small uh, cross over um, just hanging against um, the wall, the crucifixion. So we can read this, uh, we're meant to read this as an, an indigenous family that has been converted to Christianity. However, the Wendat, um, uh, of whom this is a depiction, the Wendat um, formed monogamous nuclear families who traced descent and inheritance through the female line. As among all the Iroquois nations, the fundamental socioeconomic group was the matrilineal extended family, made up of a number of nuclear families whose female members traced common descent to a mother or grandmother who was in charge of daily affairs. The extended family lived in longhouses, not in single dwellings, but with colonization and conversion to Christianity came the imposition of Western patriarchal structures and women were removed from their traditional roles within communities, creating lasting conflict. Coke Smythe came to Canada in 1838 as the drawing master to the daughter of the Earl of Durham following the rebellions of Upper and Lower Canada. The published sketches, um, the, he published sketches in the Canadas, an album of 23 hand-colored lithographs dedicated to the Earl in 1839. And the Weir collection includes a full set, at least one full set. Moving on to this uh, work, by John Raphael Smith after Joseph Wright of Darby. It is a mezzo tint titled The Widow of an Indian Chief Watching the Arms of Her Deceased Husband. And it dates to March 2nd, 1812, so the publication date. The mezzo tint was based on an oil painting by Joseph Wright of Derby, an English artist known for his romantic landscapes and portrait paintings. The original painting was first exhibited under the title Indian Widow at Wright's solo exhibition in the UK in 1785. In the exhibition catalogue, Wright described the subject of the painting as, quote, founded in a custom where the widow of an imminent warrior is used to sit the whole day during the first moon after his death under a rude kind of trophy formed by a tree 
locked and painted on which the weapons of the dead are suspended. She remains in this situation without shelter and perseveres in her mournful duty at the hazard of her own life from the inclemencies of the weather." End quote. A possible source for Wright's treatment of the subject was James Adair's The History of American Indians, published in London in 1775. Adair was an Irish historian and he described the customs of mourning among the Muscogee and Chickasaw peoples in North America. According to Adair, the act of sitting beneath a ceremonial tree was an additional part of these customs that only a widow of a war leader was expected to carry out. The weapons of the deceased were hung on the pole and these open displays of mourning were interpreted as an act of honoring the deceased and his family. Wright has depicted the female figure in a drape, in draped cloth according to a neoclassical style and situated her in this highly romantic landscape. In this way, the painting and the mezzo tint after the painting reflects the influence of romanticism and neoclassicism that was dominant in Western Europe during the late 18th and early 19th century. It also conveys ideas about the indigenous populations of North America that circulated in Europe during this period. The weapons that Wright has chosen to depict may have been based on objects that were available in England by the 18th century. The Muscogee and Chickasaw populations that Wright used as a reference for this painting lived mainly in the southeastern United States and are related through a common linguistic group. They were among the first indigenous groups to have George Washington's plan of cultural assimilation imposed upon them. The Muscogee population was divided in their response leading to a civil war among the population known as the Creek War from 1813 to 14. Encouraged by Tecumseh, the great Shawnee warrior, uh, part of the Muscogee population allied with the British during the War of 1812, while the Chickasaw population allied with the United States. But again, this, um, this very uh, uh, interesting depiction um, conveys really nothing of the individual circumstances that uh, we know of the history of these particular groups. Moving on to the 20th century, um, here we have Sybil, Ander, Sybil, Sybil Andrews, uh, sorry, um, Indian dance from 1951, a lino cut on paper. We have a line of dancers clad in brilliant red cloaks. They're wearing carved wooden masks and they circle in rhythmic fashion before the viewer. Who are they and what is the occasion? The title conveys nothing, Indian dance. It reinforces the common misconception that all the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas are the same. The date, however, is significant. From 1884 to 1951, such dances were prohibited. The cloaks, masks, and other regalia seized by officials of the Canadian state under the ubiquitous potlatch ban. It is therefore likely that the artist, a recent immigrant from England, has captured one of the first public performances by the Kwakwakwak since the 1920s when the ban was more rigorously enforced. Individual groups on the Pacific coast have special words to donate the varied ceremonies that required gift giving. But the term potlatch came to be used by Canadian officials and the settler community to identify all such ceremonies. The ban was one of many measures used to control and regulate Indigenous peoples, and particularly uh, the prohibition on travel and controlling uh, how people could move from place to place to attend a potlatch and particularly how women could uh, move. It was simply um, out of the uh, realm of understanding for a white community that Indigenous peoples would allow their women to, to um, 
travel freely and for extended periods of time. And, and this speaks to um, a very specific European idea, not only of the separation between uh, men and women in the separate spheres, but also how uh, women's behavior should, could and should be controlled. The potlatch might involve feasting, spirit dances, singing, and theatrical performances. The ceremony marked important occasions in the lives of Indigenous peoples, such as the naming of children, a marriage, the transfer of rights and privileges, the dedication of a crest pole, and also mourning the dead. Guests witnessing the event are given gifts. The more gifts received, the higher the status achieved by the potlatch host. And another um, uh, well-known um, uh, work by a well-known artist, uh, William Blair Bruce's The Mohawk Chieftain from 1895. The 1959 invoice uh, from the purchase of this painting gives the title as The Mohawk Chieftain. But since it was a session in the collection in 1983, it has been known as Chief Po Rouge Kenda. The alternative title would appear to have been invented as a romantic fiction, perhaps to satisfy expectations of a race of, quote, redskins, Po Rouge, the English translation in North America. In fact, the sitter closely resembles another portrait in the collection of the Art Gallery of Hamilton of uh, Otkaya et, uh, or William Bill is his uh, English name, a Cayuga from Six Nations who used the stage name Red Cloud. The pose and three quarter profile are the same. Uh, both men wear a single either fe eagle feather and the distinctive shell and tooth necklace and both carry a stone hatchet. The depiction tells us nothing of the individual or the life of, in the community uh, of the Six Nations at the end of the 19th century. Instead, the portrait plays on stereotypes of, quote, the Indian warrior and, quote, the disappearing Indian produced in art, theater, Wild West shows, and early films. These stereotypes have continued to circulate into the present. William Blair Bruce visited the Six Nations in 1895 while on an extended visit to his hometown of Hamilton. He produced a number of paintings of indigenous subjects and presented them to the French public at the 1898 Salon des Artistes Indépendants, where they were quite well received. And um, it's interesting how, uh, how this type of, of subject was uh, so so popular among uh, the Europeans, this idea of the exotic uh, uh, indigenous person from North America. So we do have a few, a handful of work by indigenous artists, that is examples of self-representation. And here um, I'm showing you what's titled a facsimile of an Indian painting from 1840 attributed to the artist Johann Herleman after Karl Bodmer after Mado Chope. And it's a hand colored lithograph. So this is, this has been mediated by not one, but two European trained artists. It's a copy of one of the first documented native North American works of art on paper titled Mato Tope battling a Cheyenne chief with a hatchet from 1834. It depicts an encounter between Mato Tope or forebears, his English name, a Mandan chief and a Cheyenne chief. The drawing is a rare early example of self-representation by an indigenous warrior and one of the earliest documented examples of ledger drawing, a drawing on ledger paper. The original drawing was collected by Maximilian, Princess of Weed, and copied by Carl Bodmore, then published in Travels in the Interior of North America in 1843. 
the original artist was not named. For Mato Tope, the image was an extension of drawing on bison hides that recorded personal deeds and proclaimed his status as a warrior. It served a biographical rather than a ceremonial function. For the prince, however, the drawing was an artifact to be collected as part of a larger ethnographic investigation of the customs and practices of Native North Americans. Although the artist included significant details of the encounter, its minimalist perspective prompted Maximilian to dismiss the work as, quote, childlike. Another example of self-representation is this self-portrait by Zachary Vincent, born in Lorette, Quebec in 1815 and dying in Quebec City in 1886. Here the artist is presenting a self-conscious response to the claims that the Huron-Wendat would soon be extinct. He's shown um, with his son in the lower right corner. He's wearing the traditional ceremonial objects from both the Huron-Wendat community and the British colonial power. And you'll see um, the, uh, the medal that he wears around um, his, his neck, uh, traditionally gifts from the British colonial power. Here the artist provides powerful evidence that his culture and his heritage endure, here holding the hatchet and again, uh, including his son in the, uh, in the painting. The combination of these objects of status and the strong direct gaze produce a commanding image of Vincent as a chief. Vincent was uh, introduced to easel painting when his portrait was painted by the Quebec artist Antoine Plamondon. The portrait titled The Last Huron was acquired by Lord Durham. These two works were not collected as works of art, but as artifacts re representing indigenous cultures in North America. And this important distinction, this division existed well into the late 20th century. In fact, the very first uh, work by an indigenous artist, Carl Beam, uh, entered the collection of the National Gallery in 1986. So a very uh, long standing tradition of the separation between what is considered to be a work of art and, and a work, something that is produced by an indigenous artist. Turning now to this scene uh, by Alan Sapp, getting water from near his neighbor's house in 1972. Sorry, painted in 1972. So the scene is one of many that depict the ordinary day-to-day -day life the artist experienced growing up in the Red Pheasant Reserve, on the Red Pheasant Reserve in Saskatchewan in the 1930s and 40s. In this way, they provide a uniquely authentic Indigenous viewpoint that is rare in historical can Canadian art. Paintings such as this one express the beauty of the land, even in harsh conditions, poverty, the reality of urban life, a life filled with hard physical labor and yet strong family and community relationships is conveyed throughout his oeuvre in these sensitive portrayals of the life of the Northern Plains Cree in the middle years of the 20th century. Today, life on the reserve, which is near Battleford in Saskatchewan, is difficult, particularly for young people. It was the home of Colton Bushi, for instance, the Indigenous man who was shot and killed by a local farmer in 2016. So violent uh, confrontation, although rarely referenced in our um, the art production um, is a it's also part uh, of our history of of um, our history of encounters between uh, the settler and indigenous community 
And um, so returning now to Lady Eveline Marie Alexander's uh, Lake of Two Mountains from 1851. So, uh, and to say that um, violent confrontation is also part of the history of this painting, which um, perhaps might appear to be surprising. So the Lake of Two Mountains is located at the Delta of the Ottawa River where the river widens to join the St. Lawrence west of Montreal. The peaceful and tranquil scene that's depicted here relies the complex history of the site, a history that would culminate in the Oka crisis of 1990 and the unresolved land claims made by the Kenya, Ken, Kenyan Kahaka, the Mohawk of Kanasatake. In 1721, at the direction of King Louis XV, the Roman Catholic Seminary of Saint-Sulpice established a mission near Lac des Deux Montagnes, Lake of Two Mountains. Although the Saint-Sulpice mission was supposed to hold the land in trust for the Kenyan Kahaka, the seminary expanded this agreement to grant itself sole ownership rights and later began to sell cleared land to white settlers at great profit. It also changed the name of the settlement to Oka. In 1851, the year of this painting, the people of Kanasatake sent a letter of protest to the British civil authority in British North America, an authority under which Lady Alexander's husband, Sir James Edward Alexander served. This protest was not resolved. And in 1868, the Mohawk demanded their land back. When the demand was refused, they attacked the seminary and, uh, but were forced back by military intervention. In 1936, the religious order sold the land to developers and closed the seminary. A members only golf course was built on a leased portion of the land. A proposed expansion of the golf course in 1990 sparked an armed confrontation which lasted 78 days and resulted in the death of a Quebec police officer. We have a second painting titled Lake of Two Mountains, this one, this one by Albert Henry Robinson dating to 1940. Here we have tall and slender trees which form a striking horizontal screen across the surface, fragmenting the view of a narrow band of water in the middle distance. The absence of underbrush is a noteworthy feature of the landscape. The specific location is not identified, but the trees are similar to those in an area of Oka known as the pines or also the commons. In 1886, following a series of land avalanches which submerged the village, a group of Mohawks and non-Indigenous settlers planted some 70 to 80,000 pine trees on the mountain to stabilize the ground. One of the oldest hand-painted, hand-planted stands in North America, encroachment into the pines and a near near Mohawk, nearby Mohawk cemetery were the focus of the 1990 Oka crisis. And staying uh, close by in Quebec, here we have uh, Femme de Kahnawaga from 1925, a uh, highly celebrated sculpture by Marc Barrel de Foy, Sousa Cote. The Kanawaka uh, Mohawk Territory is a First Nations reserve of the Kenyan Kahaka on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River across from Montreal. Due to its proximity to the city, Suzo occasionally use models from Kanawake, but this is one of the few works of Indigenous subjects by the artist. At the time, the artist more typically focused on Abitant history and culture the three women uh, draw, have their cloaks pulled tight against the wind and they carry baskets and bundles, perhaps containing handicrafts for sale, an important source of income for both women and men in indigenous communities. And as I mentioned, it's one of Suzor's most acclaimed sculptures. 
But it's interesting that, um, you know, so rarely we see in depictions, even though these communities are close by, uh, rarely uh, interacting and as, as part of a community um, in representations by European trained artists. It's as if they remain separate, both physically and mentally from Canadian society. And finally, uh, this last work again by Cornelius Kriegoff titled Indians and Squaws of Lower Canada from 1848, a colored lithograph. Although the scene suggests a chance meeting, the artist has arranged the figures with specific purpose. The details of dress and the objects they carry, these are important elements of what is in reality, an ethnographic portrait, a portrait that records ethnographic details, such as their dress, their possessions, their customs. The title is of course also noteworthy. Originally a word, originally a word for a woman or a young girl in the Massachusetts Algonquian language, squaw is commonly understood as a derogatory term in English today. And the application here suggests a contemporary view of native peoples of North America that all are the same, that a term that originates in the United States on the Eastern seaboard could be applied all across the continent. And um, it also suggests here that somehow uh, a squaw is a possession. It's, the title is Indians and squaws. Aren't women also Indian, um, we might ask. But um, this kind of, of terminology suggests a particular um, viewpoint or perhaps uh, ownership or possession of Indigenous women. This particular uh, work I want to end with because it raises important questions that all of our institutions are grappling with. That is how to, how to deal with uh, a title like this. Do we, do we change the title? Do we hide this work away and, and don't show it? Um, how do we, we cover it up and how do we, um, how do we address this, this problem in, um, in naming um, uh, these works from the past? <laughs>